And so it's been kind of a battle my whole journey, breaking a barrier one after another. I'm not afraid to be Asian anymore. I'm not afraid to be a woman anymore. I'm not afraid to be the only one of my identity in the room anymore. Is everything over? Shall we give up on the gaming industry now? Shall we stop trying making games, building studios and companies that have the power to positively impact the future lives of millions of players, professional and humans? No, we don't. In this special track of Rise and Play, I will be focusing on the unspoken topics around building game companies, founders teams, fundraising, pitching, rebouncing after closing your studio company or losing your job by bringing guests who are going through the same storm of 2024 like you and keep fighting. I will also share openly my own process, trials and error, and step-by-step -step building the new game company Killen as the first-time CEO of a game company. I believe we are stronger together and we don't have to go through the storm alone because at Rise and Play, we are not alone. Oh, and one last thing. As you feel supercharged by listening to this episode, it will mean a lot to me, and if you haven't done it yet, that you hit the follow button. It will help with the discovery of the show so other people can benefit from the content too. Thanks, and now let's get to the episode. Hi, I'm Shelby Maladina, and I'm here with Sophie Vo, and she invited me to come out to the Rise and Play podcast and sort of switch roles with her. And I recently was on an episode with Sophie where she interviewed me about uh, my journey with opening and then closing Double Loop Games, and it was a really meaningful podcast for me. We have a lot in common, and some of the changes personally and professionally we've gone through in the last three to six months have been generated some really interesting conversations, so I'm really excited to sit down with her. Thank you, Shelby, for uh, inviting me to my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll be open, and I look forward to the discovery of like the same you've experienced when I interviewed you. Yeah, of course. Um, so Sophie and I have been friends for a while. We've been on boards together and met up at GDC. But like I said, most recently, um, we recorded an episode of Rise and Play, your podcast. And Sophie, can you just tell us about your journey? with? How did you start the podcast? Why did you start it? And what were your goals with it? Mm-hmm. So the podcast is more of a result of a journey that started much earlier, even before it became a podcast. So maybe I'll start to, uh, at the very beginning of how I started Rise and Play. I think it was in 2021. At that time, I was building the studio, the first casual studio at Voodoo, and we were one or two years in. COVID happened. So all the ideal plans, like, oh, I want to have a studio where we meet on site every day, and we create... Uh, was very uh, purposeful, casual games, and it turned out to be more hybrid, casual, eras, very driven. So all this reality that was not very fun at the time, I needed a bit of a, it's not an escape, but an, an outlet to express other things uh, that I started to boil in me. I, I started to feel really, and I can only share a few years after frustrated at that time where I've experienced a ceiling in organization. So at that time, Voodoo was my maybe fourth organization where each time I'm thinking, I was thinking I could, uh, it would be different if I'm the team lead. It would be different if I'm the head of studio, um, how I can lead a team where I'm not forced to do things in a certain way that are very profit driven and not so human centric. So I decided at that time, fine, I'm going to create my own platform where nobody will tell me you can green light that communication or not. I would just do it and have it out of my system. So that started with the masterclass online where it was an intention of uh, instead of trying to change one organization, what if I could support multiple organizations that have consciousness of maybe how to build a studio from scratch with more consciousness around sustainability. How do we treat people? How do we make this run for longer? And so that turned into the podcast that I started. It will be the space where I invite other leaders, conscious leaders, like the ones that I follow for years, what they do, what they care, what they express about, and give them the space because they are not invited in other shows that usually talk a lot about growth and very tactical things, right? So when I look at who's talking in podcasts, I couldn't see women, for example. I know there are many that are building companies. I just don't hear about them. 
that's where I wanted to create really the space for visibility. And then it changed a lot of perception and inspire other women to create the studio and so on. And it's not just women being on the show, it's any conscious leaders and the ones that are underrepresented in the industry. That's amazing. I have a similar experience with when you start something on the side that's sort of a passion, something you care a lot about, it can really resonate and take on a life of its own. Like when you started, they're saying, when you started that masterclass, you didn't know what it would be three years later. You didn't know where it would lead. But I really believe in that. Like just make something and make it right now and see how it goes and then make another thing and see how it goes and and just get out there and do it. There's Sometimes I feel in games and in film, which I'm working on now, there's often a really big mental block toward waiting for someone to give you permission to do a thing. Like mm-hmm. you didn't wait for someone to give you permission to make a masterclass or give, wait for someone to give you permission to make a podcast. And that's how you really make change. And that's amazing. I, that's amazing. Where did it go from there? Um, what You started the podcast, you started having leaders, as you said, thoughtful, human-centric leaders on there. And what are some of the surprising and interesting stories and feedback and kind of experiences people have had because of the show? Yeah, so to date, because I now I, uh, I decided to put the number of episodes, so I published this week the 123rd episode, so that's the number of people wow. who has been through the show. That's amazing. Yeah, and so you can say that I developed a super intelligence getting all the wisdom of different people and that anyone listening to the podcast in a row can also, I think Claire has been through that journey. She had time to just go through the content. And for the people who were on the show, this is where it was a lot of give and receive, you know, because sometimes the podcast, you feel, oh, okay, I'm going to be there to give as a guest and my wisdom. But actually the feedback I got also from guests is like, wow, you really created the space to express things I've never expressed before. And that I realized even without knowing it at the time, I was doing almost a coaching session, which is a lot about listening, mirroring, asking the right question. And that was also the genesis of understanding further my journey in this whole leadership rise and play. It, it, it was that magical space where, uh, especially busy leaders, they would make time to be there in the show. And then they felt so relaxed. It's like, this is the time where I have that undivided attention that I never get because I give it to the team, to uh, my investors, to my partner, you know, like the demand of life. And this is the moment where I'm, I just can be. And I think it was very, through the conversation and the question I asked, people realized new thoughts, realization were happening during the conversation. And I, I think that's the uh, guests are learning about themselves and the listener are learning. And I am learning from what they say as well. Everyone is learning. So that that I think this is what makes really the podcast special. That ability uh, to really listen carefully. It's like we are both on this ride as we start a conversation and we don't know where this will go, but it's okay. It's going to be nice, exciting. And then, you know, we are on like a nice dance together for one hour. So... Rise and Play hasn't been the only thing you've been up to for the last few years, of course. Um, Could you tell us a little bit about the company you joined recently and that journey and kind of how it's leading you to where you are now? Yeah. So as I recorded an episode, I think a few weeks ago, it was with Claire, where I also announced before GDC, Kilan. And maybe I have to go to how it started. So it was end of last year where I was announcing going full-time with Rise and Play. So I was very committed to the mission. Like I I see there's some needs in the industry around leadership, uh, supporting, you know, new leaders, uh, creating the opportunities for other different type of leaders to even have the opportunity. And in that work, I was approached by um, the team of two co-founders who needed help first. It was like more needed help on their uh, business idea. It was not Kilan at the time. It was a different name. It was very naturally that uh, when I just did my job, looking at analyzing the co-founder team uh, and alignment with business, is it the right team for the right idea? Like, well, everything you want to do is great, but you just don't have a CEO. Somebody has to fundraise, you know? It's like, cool, you want to work on a game? Cool, you want to work uh, with people? And and who's going to own the business here? So just asking the question. And they were like, yeah, right, we miss a CEO. And hey, Sophie, (laughs) how about... Uh, So that's... That was an opportunity that showed, and um, I think I was still recovering from years and years working in corporate structure, and I just 
didn't want anything to do with that. But then the piece that was emotional for me was Vietnam, like where they, the catch was for me. It's a business in Vietnam. And I was, again, back to my core with Rise and Play. I want to really open the doors to create opportunities in places where there are not equal opportunities. So I took a very emotional decision. Like I have fears. I am not sure I want to commit to that journey of fundraising, but I'm committed to Vietnam. I'm committed to the mission and I'll, I'll try. So that's how it started. And as a CEO, for me, the decision was not, I want to build a company that will exit and make millions. I didn't even know where that would go, but I was very focused on learning. What is the piece of the journey of an entrepreneur that I was missing was fundraising. And I thought here it served on the plate for me in a way where there's a team committed, they have an idea, they started already for some time. I jump in and I, I keep the journey. So I said, okay, I all in, I start to fundraise, and that's how I communicated around it. And I treated it as an experiment, uh, to be honest, where I thought, focus on learning. I can spread it over a year, be cautious, not be too visible, only to announce it when we are successful. But I was approaching it really more like a crash dummy. So like, let's hit the wall as fast as possible to understand what are even the walls. I did fundraising like in super speed. I talked to, I don't know, 30, 40 investors in, uh, within a few months. People told me like, this is a mistake. You should spread. Uh, you should not talk to everybody at the same time. It's like, but I don't learn. Then I learn too slowly. I, I need to understand. So I was willing to, in a way, get the first no. And I got the no's to understand what was uh, not working in our proposal. So we started at 5 million, then uh, lower at 3 million, then at some point it's like lower, lower. It's like, how does that even make sense? Um, brand new team, uh, hard sell, and talking to a lot of other founders that even were looking better on paper, it was a very difficult sell. So it was good to learn that quickly. And then I learned also a lot through the process, what actually is valued. If it's not that, what else is valued? And that's what led to maybe further thought of, you know, iteration of the company. But yeah, we can get into that. But I wanted to share more of the journey, how I got into building Kilan. That's really interesting. And I think I don't want to paint too broad a picture about gender or anything, but I do find that the women leaders that I talk to, there is usually less of an element of ego, like you were saying about, oh, don't announce anything till it's successful. I find that most of my opportunities ha and learnings have come because I'm just like, let's just make it, let's just try it. It might turn out, it might not, but that actually always sort of turns into a thread of something you can use later in the future. So just that thread of that fearlessness to just try, like how long has that been sort of like a core element of you and what sort of like honed that for you in your life? Hmm. To the first uh, point of how women we perceive about our, our image, I think we start from a, a lower image of ourselves where we are not thinking even in coaching, I see that. So we are perceiving ourselves lower than how, how others are perceiving us. And because of that, because we are not that high and there's nothing to save, then we are okay to be out there and ask for help sometimes, you know? it's uh, So yes, uh, when I announce the studio, it's like, if I don't announce, I'm not going to talk to anybody at GDC. So I'm not going to be on, you know, traction or excitement. So when I did, it's like, oh, we should talk at GDC. And I had all my meeting lined up, although we were not fully ready, but you're never ready, right? So at least- You're never ready. It's never a good time. Just yeah, do yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. I would say for the, for that part, when you ask yourself, should you announce or not? I would say approach it like a product. It's like, there's a saying with a product, if you don't feel embarrassed about what you, <laughs> you launch, then you're already too late. So in the same way, I felt like, what 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 bad can happen? And then if we don't exist months from now, who cares? People will forget. So I, I was not even thinking too far. And about that uh, attitude to fear, I actually had a journey, personal journey, from being f fearful to fearless. And it's been a more a journey of self development where I grew up, you know, with a lot of. Uh, distrust to uh, the system. My parents are immigrants from Vietnam, so of course they don't trust the government, they don't trust the system, the world. And when I was uh, in France, I was born in France, I was the only Asian at school, so I was the object of, uh, you know, mockery, uh, love for a feeling inferior, so all those things, it's just create. I was afraid of a lot of things when I was a kid. I was afraid of my own parents because they were very also strict. I was afraid of others because I thought everybody would want to harm me. And so it's been kind of a battle my whole journey where I am today more of 
breaking a barrier one after another. I'm not afraid to be Asian anymore. I'm not afraid to be a woman anymore. I'm not afraid to be the only one of my identity in the room anymore. And that has been helped a lot, I must say, by inspiration around me. I, I have to give a lot of credit to several examples, whether they were men, women, that I could relate to. It's like, well, they, did, they didn't start from privilege. They started from hardship. And how did they get there? And then I was just asking the story, and this is, okay, if they could do it, I could do it too. So just seeing a bit uh, of inspiration and example, and that's why for me, seeing other women like you and uh, Emily, like building the studio, that signal to me, I feel equal. I feel equal to uh, those other people and I can do it too. That's why it's so important when men don't understand, oh, okay, uh, representation, it's nice. It doesn't do anything. It's like you don't know actually what we miss to experience that. And the podcast highlighting just a lot of women being successful in their own way just give you actually the conviction that you can get there too. And you can. It's so true. Thanks for sharing. I want to talk about the, your later times at Keelan and how that wrapped up and what your process there was and how that led you to your next focus. It was, um, the start of the year was really an emotional journey for me because I was in it and it's like being in a high, you know, so I was like, FOMO, I'm going to learn about fundraising, learn, because I was almost even testing for myself, like with a bit of distance. Is it a viable business idea even? Is it the thing I should be spending my time in? And there was a moment after GDC where, okay, I, I had a round, I, I had enough data point, and I was analyzing. So I was in anal analysis mode. And this is where I started to also... Um, apply some hard decision around our company and the business because as a CEO, uh, I approached really like building a new studio. You look at, uh, you know, who are in the seats and are there the right people in the right seats? So I examined the co-founder team. We were free at the time. So a COO, C, uh, CEO, Alexi, uh, that was publicly announced as my co-founder on the creative side and myself as the CEO. One thing is as we were reducing budget, it made less and less sense to have some roles that are pure management. And it was, okay, now that we're really going all like scrappy, bootstrappy, what makes sense is like we don't need a CEO, we don't have people to manage. We need people who can actually make the game, prototype. So I'll do this and that. Alex, you do this and that. And the third person was like, what else can you do? And then this is where we had a difficult conversation. Well, actually, I don't want to do that. So that was a conversation we've had. And that was the realization. That's why I always go back to the co-founder team and alignment. The realization, and without getting in detail, was misalignment of the motivation of the third co-founder with actually what the business required. I was really impressed by... Uh, the maturity of a third co-founder to say step out and say actually this is not what I want and I was relieved as well it made things easy where I didn't have to force the exit although I could see that it was the the outcome and then it was the two of us as the two co-founders and then it, it changed really the dynamic where okay we start really the business from scratch where that's the money we have which is zero at the moment what can we build what can we uh, prototype you know, prototyping a PC game and we were even like building a system for multiple PC games to be uh, shipped. This is where you test the relationship for real. So that's the second part I wanted to say, um, the learning. It, it is really, I think, the honeymoon uh, co-founder phase. When you, it's not to say it's impossible to work with people you haven't worked before, but you have to be very aware that it takes a good year, even more, to really know the person and it's, by doing things together, working really together that you actually know and not by talking. To, to finish on that point, this is where we realize actually very core um, differences on how we see how to run a company, how to build games, and to a point that it was non-negotiable. And that was a stopping point for me. Is like, this is not even a company if we can't work together. And it was a point to already step out. But before we get into that, I wanted to ask you as well, how does that resonate with you? As you know, I know the co-founder journey it's one also you've been through. Yeah, you're, uh, everything you're saying is so true. Um, I also started Double Loop with my friend, Emily, who I had never worked with before. And we did as much as you're talking about, as much talking ahead of time as you can. But there are certain things you just can't figure out until you're in it and, and doing it. 
And we found our way through those things. Um, but you're right. I mean, there were surprises between us four years into it. And what I'm really impressed with you, and I, we talked about it a little before, is how maturely all of you came to that realization and that you talked through it with a lot of sensitivity and that you came out the other side with good relationships because um, like my co-founder and I also have a good relationship, but it's just not always the case. Like, like you're saying, you have to really approach that really intentionally. So I think that's pretty amazing. Thank you. And it was really hard in that sense where I, I would, um, for, for the listeners who are in this situation or are thinking of building a company with new co-founders, I would really approach it with um, structure, right? So how do you approach this conversation and decision-making? And uh, the point where um, it was very clear to me that it would be a hard journey, uh, it was more a personal uh, decision for me. Okay, I, I realized we don't know each other that well between the co-founders and we live in different places. What is the sacrifice it would take for me to accelerate the process? Should I move? And it's a, it's a change in my life. And this, this tested my motivation at the time because we could have had figured it out. It's Everything is negotiable. You know, you, you build the trust over time. But that was where it was testing my motivation and I was not ready to make the sacrifice, personal sacrifice for that particular company. So this is where I realized that instead of making a discussion about you are the problem, you are the wrong one for me, it was more, this is not what I actually want to do because... Otherwise, I would have done it and I would, without a second, move to Vietnam and do it and, you know, work with you, you know. And it was not about him or it was not about the company. It was more about me. And owning that, that I think it's how you exit with grace because you don't blame the others. You tried and you try to discover and being honest. This is where you can be honest with investors. I think it's actually responsible when you are not really in the journey to uh, uh, step out yourself because it's a painful one. And when you can't deliver, everyone's disappointed. So that, again, is another thing that I feel I resonate with as I now see how important that is. But I personally did not have that skill 20 years ago, or I would second guess, like, is this something I should push through and stick to, even though it's painful, because you can't just give up on everything that's hard. But yes. to figure out the difference between this is hard and I should stick to it versus this is not in alignment with what I want to do and is good for me. What has been your experience and growth in that area through your life? Did you start out just already core, knowing your core values? I, I doubt it. But like, how did you come to that? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, the differences between giving up too early or for the wrong reason, right? And it's not mm -hmm. giving up, it's all a narrative. Yeah. And I share a story here uh, where I have, it was not my first uh, startup. I built one almost 10 years ago, yes. It was a fashion uh, startup in Berlin, something out of games. I did it on the side of Wuga as well. And it went too serious. It was a, a fashion app that would uh, locate around you all the local shops that had cool design, uh, cool designers that you couldn't find uh like normal, like Zara and all the brands, Google Maps. So it was a discovery app. We built it with a team of co-founders with uh, two other women friends as well at work. And it went serious quickly because we built the app very effectively. It was working. And then it became into that B2B, B2C platform. And when it became real, I got scared. I got scared and I got scared. It's like, oh, this could actually work. And then if this is big, I'm not working games anymore. I'm committed to that journey. Do I care? And I sabotaged myself, uh, now I can say 10 years after, where, well, one of my co-founders also stepped out. We were two, then left. And then something very personal happened. I, I had a relationship at the same time. And then suddenly all my priorities were tested. I prioritized the relationship and I wanted to enjoy that phase of my life and I didn't want to sacrifice. And then it was a very hard realization where I was, had to be honest with myself. I can't actually... Um, I don't want to do this. And so back to the giving up and so on, I had to reframe only years after that it was not a failure. I gave up. It was my business school. Instead of investing in the MBA, I built my company. And that was actually the actual motivation. I was excited of solving a problem, building the apps, proving to myself I could do it. But I, I, I was not interested in building a company, scaling it and having an exit. So I think it was always going back to my why. And Kilan, my why was not to, I didn't start that company with 
I want to have an exit with a company. It was, I wanted to give it a shot to make something in Vietnam. And when that was tested and when I realized maybe that's not the right one for me, I, d I didn't see this as giving up. I saw it more as I'm giving up on that company, but I'm not giving up on building a company. And that uh, was an important reframing. So you are focusing on something different now that is really exciting. And you went back and how did you figure out your, your what is your why? Your, your why wasn't in alignment with that company. How did you figure out what you wanted to do next? And how does that align with what you value? Hmm. Something I've done like, almost like a ritual uh, since, I don't know, seven, eight years in my self-development journey is uh, doing regular retrospective review. So every six months, I do a bit of an analysis, what I've done the past six months, what I've learned, what went well, what I like, what I did not like, and what does that mean with those learnings? So a bit like you are your own product, you analyze. That's what I do actually a lot in coaching, helping over others to find structure in, in the analysis. And so that's oh, how I, I don't want to interrupt you too much, but I do want to say that's one of the things I love about you is how <laughs> much you approach all of your projects and everything as a product manager <laughs> approach with like experiment, measure, adjust, experiment, measure, adjust that, that it, I've, I've had so many experiences with you telling me your insights about different areas that it's just so interesting. And I love that. It's so much part of my nature that I never again reflect on that. And then so uh, that, that's how I discovered more of the time analyzing the past. And so back to my why, I, I just identified common themes of things I've studied very intuitively because where your energy is, is where your natural talents and interests are. And so there was a big component around people. So that's why like, I have a key word, like it's connection, building connection, podcast connection, communities connection, building a team connection, players for a game connection. So that is a big theme in my life, connections and growth, like growth transformation, uh, unlocking your potential, but not for performance, but for your fullest version. When you are fully yourself, this is a moment of joy, serenity, you know, lightheartedness. And I think this is really, I, I, I wish that, I wish a world where everyone would reach that state because we wouldn't have those ego fights and all those, those things that are, at the end of the day are really rooted in that. So there's a strong purpose for me to help in the connection to the self and to others. That was the main theme. And then the second point when I took a step back, okay, as I'm in the motion to build a company, how can I leverage the skills and the experience like with a compounding effect? So again, thinking of it as a product and what is it? The compounding effect was uh, like my, how deep I have been into leadership, coaching human uh, understanding, helping human puzzle. And so those two components together, connection, human and games. And I put this together and a word that came a lot during the um, uh, GDC and uh, with all investors was AI. <laughs> AI, what do you have as AI in your company? It's like we only invest in AI. And I thought maybe I should look into that as well now, like building a company in 2024. And so all putting all those things together, that turned into something very unique that I'm set to build, not in games, but around coaching, around human and leveraging technology, AI, and games. And interestingly as well, when you are not looking to raise and I'm getting out of games, then the ones are who are interested in what you're doing in your mission are finding you. So just before that call, I was telling you, I had, I don't know how, an uh, investor in ed tech, which I would have never thought about, but the, like search and uh, stalking, is like what you build is really what we were looking for. So and then having that kind of relationship is another experience of building a company where you build the right thing, uh, you solve a problem, you create value. And then with, there's a matchmaking process that happened with investor. Instead of forcing that door where I'm building that game that no one cares about with investor who don't care about you building a game, you know, and, and it's like a door you try to force, but just doesn't open. Definitely. And I think this is another one of those things that's surprising that sometimes when you are are brute forcing something that isn't quite a fit and it's hard to let it go, but then you do let it go. It clears your mind for things like this. Like yeah. this, I, I'm guessing this wouldn't have happened at this perfect nexus. You know, if you were still forcing, yes. if you were, if you were working on something you didn't feel as passionate about that takes up, you know, 40, 60, 80 hours of your week, your brain just isn't thinking about those things that might be a natural fit. Yeah. And in, in the end, it's, I see, I approach it really like a, a journey. You, you, you go step by step, right? And you trust the process, but 
The main compass is yourself. You are the judge at the end of the day of your actions and decision. As long as you are in tune with you are making the right decision, you know, it's it's really important to be connected. So I really trust that process and being open to what, uh, you know, emerge. And that's how Rise and Play developed to uh, that new business. And I'll, I would love to talk more about it when I have a, a bit few uh, uh, things more concrete and I will test with industry first. So, but it's very exciting and I, I feel very energized these days and I can feel the same for you despite the fact that, you know, you had to close in a very hard moment last year. Yeah, yeah I, I love that because I do see the, I see the sort of inner glow and joy on your face too. <laughs> and when you feel like you're doing the thing that brings you that joy and is aligned with your values and is working, it's a really exciting time. And I kind of love, just selfishly, I kind of love that we're on sort of a similar like timeline and journey mm-hmm. because... Yeah. In anything, it's like it's nice to have fellowship with, and like your network helps you. And it's like even closing the company down, having a network of people to call and cry to was it was so important. And as we're going through this part, I love watching what you're doing, and I can't wait to hear more about it. And I also want to pick your brain about fundraising because I've seen it done, but also haven't done it myself. And I'm going to be tackling and finding those walls for myself too (laughs) so very inspiring in that way and I'm also just wanted to also say that I think you know five years ago it was hard to raise money but we were able to raise money I thought an article by David Kay was really good I think I mentioned in the last episode but you know he pointed out that now they're not investing on a promise of a market fit now you really need to demonstrate market fit before you can raise and so I'm really happy for you that you found a way to build and get out there without fundraising first, because that seems to be the thing you have to do right now. And, yes. and I, I, I'm sure how much of that played into your motivation to do it this way, or is it mainly that it's just so easy to streamline and go this way? Or how did you, what are you feeling about the market forces on investment? And did that affect you at all in how you started this? So approaching like a product, I took the main learnings from the first fundraising uh sprint <laughs> let's call it that way starting low starting with a small team like minimum where you can actually be in IC I would say was uh, how I start a company in 2024 people you know so here I would be like an investor t- taking shortcuts so you start from your network first and picking the people you trust already and can or build the trust quickly um, because there's just no luxury and uh, time to build that unfortunately during those days Tapping, starting with what's your unfair advantage. So that was really how I thought about it. And that was what's my unfair advantage, my depth into the network, the leadership, games, and the combination with coaching. This is, I did my research now after a month. There's, there's no one with like that set of skills like this, uh, that specifically. And I will build on top of that. So I would really recommend people starting the business from that point of view in 2024, instead of being attached of the what, but like really why and who. That makes a lot of sense. Mm. I'm so grateful you invited me to sort of reverse host interview you. It's been a lot of fun. And um, as always, I really love talking to you and I'm really excited for what's coming next. And when you announce it publicly, I'm going to keep my eye on it. Yeah. I can say one thing. Oh, yeah. My new company is called Olivia. Olivia? Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's so cute. Mm. I love that. That's very sweet. Yeah, so watch out for Olivia and um, maybe we'll discuss more in a future episode. But Shelby, I wanted to say I felt really good from the conversation. So I feel super pumped and energized. So you, you know, uh, you did it really well at the, you know, rise and play expectation, even if I were not. But really, I experienced what maybe others could have ex- experienced. And I would love you to, to have you on the show a bit more, whether as a guest or a, a host, because I think you've done amazing today uh i feel really good from the conversation thank you so much i mean i think it's because you foster such a great environment and i would love to i'm kind of on sabbatical kind of doing this giant other personal project and this is the type of thing that refills my bucket as well and i'd love to spend more time with you on the show Mm. thanks a lot shelby and uh, take care thanks for listening to this latest episode of the rise and play podcast I am growing a community of conscious leaders across the industry and beyond. If you want to join this movement, please share the podcast with other conscious leaders because we have so much more we can learn from each other. If you've enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate the show on Spotify or your other favorite podcast platform. It will help other growing leaders to discover the show and benefit from the valuable insights. 
If you would like to grow rapidly your leadership skills, you can find more insights on raisinplay.io, where you will also find my free masterclass on conscious leadership and other resources that I offer. Have a great week, and remember to take care of yourself. Until the next time, 